Welcome to the Mal and Johnny Show. And today's guest is a very different type of guest to our normal guest on the show. Uh, I first got in touch with Sean, uh, where we were talking about going to Afghanistan together. I know, that sounds rather strange. So, Sean, welcome to the Mal and Johnny Show. And this is Johnny and this is Sean. So, welcome to you both. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Now then, Sean, just so we get a little bit of uh, background about you, I've mentioned Afghanistan. I just want to put that to one side for a moment. Where did you come from and what was your upbringing like? Oh, OK. Um, well, um... My mum is Welsh from the Swansea Valley, Astra Gunlais, uh, was where she grew up. Um, but she married an Englishman, um, and uh, for her sins, as she would say, <laughs> and moved to, down to uh, Sussex eventually. And that's where I grew up, um, in, in Sussex, down by the sea near Brighton. And a very sort of normal upbringing, just, just, just average sort of growing up sort of little girl in Sussex by the sea? Yeah, I guess so. You know, youngest of three, mm-hmm. um, usual things, played hockey for the town. Um, right. My brother was a great rugby fan, I, you know, went away to university uh, at the age of 18. And um, I became uh, a ju- juvenile justice worker and then a probation officer. So uh, fairly unremarkable, really. All right. So a normal career path. I think Johnny and I can both understand that. Why Afghanistan? Why did you want to go to Afghanistan? Were you asked to go? Or is it something that you really felt that you wanted to do? Well, when I uh, when I was a probation officer, I was reminded that at university I'd had a desire to go overseas. And um, and so I gave it all up and I went to All Nations Christian College uh, to study in cross-cultural um, sort of biblical studies. And on the way there, I remember praying to God saying, I'll go anywhere you want, but I don't want to go, I don't really want to work with Muslims. Um, And it took six weeks for God to persuade me that actually um, that was rubbish and that he wanted me to go to Afghanistan. Wow, Afghanistan. I mean, so this is, so Johnny, I come from this sort of background. So this is, uh, this is like a normal conversation for me in in many aspects of my life, right? So stick (laughs) stick with us on this. Um, I'm sticking with you. Why did you want to go to Afghanistan, Mal? Did you want to do a gig in Afghanistan? Well, well, it's funny because I was going to go and meet Sean. Sean was out there working in Herat and I'd been asked by a a, a friend we had in common about going out there. He was trying to convince me to take a, a, a tape recorder and a, and a guitar. He thought we could smuggle them in, and we could maybe yeah. do a radio program or write some songs while I was there. Uh, but obviously, the you know the country was controlled as it is now by the Taliban, and so it, it, it all stopped. And we'll come to maybe come to that reason now. When you when you say you were told that you had to go to Afghanistan, I mean, for me and Johnny, then was it a voice? Was did you did somebody come into you? You know, did you hear this disembodied voice, or was it uh, was it more inside you rather than in your ears? Well, I have to say it was a mix. And we, we had people coming back from Afghanistan talking about it. Um, and uh, I began to sort of feel really pulled to that area of the world. And there wasn't a lot of activity, uh, you know, Christian activity going on. And um, I sort of began to feel that that might be the right place. But I didn't know what I would do there. And I remember sort of sitting in a lecture one day thinking to myself, well, God, you know, I'd, I'll go, but I, I don't know what would I do there. And and I heard a disembodied voice say, just go. Wow. I, I, I nearly fell off my chair. You know, wow. I was so amazed by it. Wow. Where were I you? had a voice once told me to go to Vietnam, but it was my agent. I didn't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the time of the war in Vietnam, and yes. they wanted to drop me in a helicopter. And he said they have heat-seeking missiles, and they sort of got to fly very low and drop you in. I said, I think I'll pass on that gig. I said. <laughs> well, Johnny's got a point, to be honest, Sean. I mean, because Afghanistan at that stage was controlled by the Taliban. I mean, it was, if you're going to go to a, a Muslim country, that was the one most governed by what they would say is Sharia law. Yes, yeah, and I think that was so. Um, I guess I was really inspired by the people who were there already, who were working, and who'd who'd stayed through amazing things. You know, in that, you know, at that time, one chap came and he'd been staying in Kabul when the Mujahideen were rocketing it, um, uh, two thousand rockets an hour going into Kabul, and there was still a group of expatriates working in development programs, trying to serve the people of Afghanistan and trying to show them God's love. Um, in in a very real practical way, and that you know that was just so amazingly inspiring. And and he talked about sort of experiencing God's protection and, and that. So without wanting to be gung ho about it, um, it just it 
it just thought, okay, well, if it's right to do, it's right to do. Um, I'll, I'll go. What's the difference between the Mujahideen and um, uh, the Taliban and ISIS? They're all at each other's throats. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all uh, fundamentally uh, Islamic groups. Um, now, the Mujahideen were um, freedom fighters, in inverted commas, who were uh, supported to kick the Soviets out of Afghanistan. Um, and they're um, a mixed bunch of different uh, tribal groups who sort of formed an alliance. Um, and then when the Soviets left Afghanistan, um, uh, they sort of then started competing with each other for who would have overall control of it. Um, right. And uh, so they started. Now, the Taliban, um, because the Mujahideen were, um, they were, seen as thieves, as robbers, you know, they were coming in and looting places. The Taliban arose sort of in response to that. They're, they're also a majority uh, Pashtun tribe. And they wanted to bring the rule of law, the rule of God, and they wanted to um, make the place safe and secure. So in one way, they had um, honourable intent, you might say. Um, and they went into battle uh, and they, they were the ones who were, were more powerful. Mm. Partly that's because they then had the support of Osama bin Laden, um, who was funding their activities, because their theological school of, of Islam was probably more alike to Osama bin Laden's than to the Mujahideen. Mm. Um, so that was sort of um, how they, they came about, uh, to be in the place that they were with the backing. You know, they had a, a significant funding coming through from Osama bin Laden, which enabled them to get the, the arms and the support that they needed to take the country. Um, mm -hmm. But then all of those, I guess, good intentions were, were um, overtaken by the, the very rigid understanding and imposition of Sharia law. Um, oh. that, that they brought with them. And really, they were imposing a culture onto the rest of the tribal groups in Afghanistan and a way of being and a way of understanding Islam. Mm. Now then, you say you, you, if you, you know, go, uh, it's, it's probably not quite that easy. What sort of steps did you have to go through to, to get that position? Because you went to Herat. Am I right in saying that Herat was your home base in that's, that's right. Yes, it, Her Herat was my home base, and I so I started off by applying to a, a mission organisation, which is where I met our mutual friend, um, and uh, I was accepted for uh, this placement. And but what they do is second me to a different organisation because um, a mission organisation couldn't work directly in Afghanistan, and so I was seconded to um, a faith-based development organisation called the International Assistance Mission. And I work with them in development uh, then. And I said initially, um, having been accepted by them, um, I then did six months language study um, in Kabul. And then having finished my language study in Kabul, I then moved to Herat and began working in mental health pro program there. What, what, what was Herat like? Because I've, I've seen the pictures and I've been looking at them lately because cause you've been very much on my mind as I've seen the stories of Afghanistan. It just looks such a beautiful place. It is. Um, Herat's really the oasis um, city in the middle of the desert there. It's, it's on the border with Iran. And so it has a lot of Iranian Persian influence. And so the mosques um, that are there, you know, have a lot of this sort of blue tile work um, um, and they're, they're very pretty. It's a small city, it only has about a quarter of a million people there, as opposed to Kabul, which, you know, had three million um, in in its heyday, as it were. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of um, very, it's very quiet, quiet in some ways, but 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 lively, uh, exuberant colours. Um, it, it's uh, very sandy, very dry, zero humidity at some times, uh, and dust storms would come up and they'd cover everything with dust and sand. Um, but but yes, yeah, some verdant green areas. Um, um, and and very you know the mountains around their beautiful colours. Mm. Because Johnny, just I, just to bring it, you know, uh, so I've been doing some history. <laughs> we look well. I've googled. I've googled it. You know, because yeah, yeah. this is this is a part of the world that's used to being uh, overtaken by different parties. You know, Alexander the Great went in there. Then you know the I suppose the Mongol, Mongol Empire. It's they're used to being 
lorded over by somebody or another, aren't they? And they've they've had to well, deal with it. Well, they're surrounded, aren't they, Mal, with different countries? They're like landlocked, mm. and they've got everybody around them, I suppose. So, I'm just just a question to Sean. So, what language do they speak? They speak Iranian. They speak um, Arabic. What do they speak? <laughs> Well, um, th- most Afghans speak Afghan Dari, which is a version of Persian. Oh, so Persian. Iranians speak Iranian Farsi. Um, and say say Iranian Farsi is like Queen's English. Well, Afghan Dari is Cockney. Oh, I um, yeah. So, so that's what we learn to speak. Now, the Pashtuns speak Pashtu, mm. um, which is... I would say almost completely different. Um, there are some similar, there are Arabic words in there, um, yeah. but it is a very different language. Mm. When, when you get there, the Taliban are in control of the whole country. Is it their country at that stage when you when you arrive? When I arrive, um, the Taliban are mostly in control of the country. They, they're they still battling with uh, Mahmud Shah up in, in the north, and that was an ongoing battle. Um, and so Mazari Sharif wasn't ruled by the Taliban. But the other major cities, so Kabul, Jalalabad, Kandahar, Herat, they were all under Taliban um, uh, administration. Mm. Uh, Ka- Kabul at that stage, did it have a lot of Westerners there, ex- expats and stuff, or was it, it was starting to become more empty? It was fairly empty. Um, there were uh, different organisations there. But if, if I could say that uh, I think it was something like from during the Taliban period, there were probably about 40 different organisations there to post-Taliban where there were 400 different organisations there. You know, that that was the big change. So there weren't that many expatriates um, wandering around the streets of either Kabul, really, or Herat, uh, much, much fewer in Herat. Uh, than in Kabul. Yeah. When you got to Herat, then t- take us through that experience. Uh, you dress, you have to dress, I suppose, in traditional costume. Are you allowed to meet with local people? to, to, to you know, Because you wanted to go and help the mental health of women in particular in, that, in Herat, wasn't it? I think that was the plan. Were you able to meet with local women? Yes, um, in different ways. Um, so, yes, I did have to dress. Uh, I didn't have to wear the full... You know, the shuttlecock burqa, we refer to it as, with with the grill and all of that. Um, But I did have to have my head with a a very long scarf, which then also covered most of my body. Um, Trousers and a skirt or dress on the top of that. Um, So, um, you know, long sleeves. So nothing or very limited showing, not allowed to show your ankles or, or that sort of thing. So I would have to wear that one out in public. In the office, I, you know, I could take my scarf off, um, and obviously at home, uh, that, that was fine. Um, meeting with with women was kept to an absolute uh, minimum. So we had some female workers um, who worked both for for us in the mental health team, but also the community development project. Um, and so we could meet with them. They had to be in separate offices from the men. They had to come through a separate door. They weren't allowed to to meet with the men at all um, at the office. Um, and then with the work that we did, um, initially, certainly at the clinic, we ran a, a, a clinic, a psychiatric clinic, and there were women and children coming to that clinic and we could meet with them there as well. Um, and then there was some interaction with neighbours. So I would uh, go and have you know tea or coffee with neighbours periodically. Um, but it, it, it was very strictly monitored. We had to be very careful and we needed to be sure that we weren't obviously being seen going to visit people very often for their safety um, because there was a real culture of, of um, telling and spying on each other and you know the Taliban would put pressure on people to say well who's visiting who and who's and what are these foreigners doing and, and so you had to be very careful about what you did and who you were seen talking to. You know the separation between the women and the men because I went to Jeddah once and it was very similar I mean mm-hmm. you wouldn't see many women in the street at all anyway but if they were, they were with their husbands. They were all covered up. So if, if a woman, for instance, has to go to hospital, would she be treated by another woman or by another man? Well, the, the idea was that they had to be treated by a woman. Women could only be seen by women, and they still had to have a male escort with them. Um, if women were found on the street without male escorts, they were in danger of being beaten. Um, mm. They used rubber pipes, and they would beat them around the ankles um, for being out without without an escort. Yeah. Um, so, and, and part of the issue was that obviously once 
the Taliban came into power, children, girls weren't allowed to go to school. So there were female doctors who were able to practice medicine, but there were no new young doctors being trained mm. because they weren't allowed to go to school and they weren't allowed to go to university. Right. What sort of problems did they have? Were they just the problems that we would have in, in Wales? You know, because obviously we're all under pressure, particularly having gone through the whole pandemic and, you know, mental health has been very much on a lot of people's minds. Uh, was it those sort of problems or were there problems directly related to their situation in, in that particular part of the world? There were a whole uh, plethora of problems, really. Um, at the point that I went to Herat, Afghanistan had been in armed conflict for 25 years with one sort or another. <laughs> now, that's continued for another 20. Um, you know, we're talking 45 years of ongoing armed conflict, really. But no, at that point, 25 years of armed conflict, the Soviet occupation and the bloodbath that took place as a result of that was, was very much in lived memory. Um, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of post-traumatic stress and anxiety as a result of that. Women's lot in particular was very difficult, not being able to leave the house, um, having limited access, female heads of households really struggling. Um, young girls being given in marriage to um, much older men or a second wives. Um, so that, that sort of a cult, you know, that sort of stress as well, as well as it being a, a country of huge poverty, great, great, you know, issues around poverty, a huge uh, maternal um, infant mortality rate um, and the drought had at that point there been a drought in the country for five years as well which has significantly impacted food security on top of that so you know multi-layered issues um, affecting them at that time causing a great deal of mental distress yeah. I've never read the Quran but are these severe things that they do like cutting people's hands off and beating women and so on stoning them is that actually in like in the Old Testament it's an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth Christian uh, but not Christian sorry before Christians um, so is it a very ancient laws they're still adhering to or aren't they in there at all because they say that Muslim is a, uh, is a, is a very pacifist uh, religion Yes, yes. It was, is, Islam is, is from the derivative of salam, which is peace. Um, it, I can't answer your question specifically. A lot of the rules come from traditions or hadiths. So they may be mentioned in, in the Quran. So what, what you might have, if you took the, the Bible as an example, you, mm. you have the scriptures which say certain things. And then there's a whole school of understanding um, or analysis of that. Um, which are called the traditions. And they would be making, I guess, comments about what was meant by that or what the purpose of that was. Mm. Um, and these are the hadiths. Uh, and so some of this will also be in the hadith. So they might not be Quranic, but they are recognized in different schools. Now, there are several different schools um, of thought, and, and they vary in how they interpret those those traditions how they interpret the Quran mm -hmm. um, uh, so what what does it mean for a woman to be kept separate that may vary depending on um, the tradition the school and, and what how they read the Quran mm -hmm. I, I seem to there are certain things this is 20 years ago since we last met so there's certain things one is that actually knitting for some reason I, I have a feeling that did you do knitting in in it was cross stitch. Cross stitch. Why did you yeah. do cross stitch? Was that all you, you know, did you have to find things to fill your time with? It was just, it's always stuck with me. Yes, yeah. Well, it was partly um, because, uh, well, there was very little electricity in Herat. We had a generator running for four hours of an evening. Um, and uh, we did have a television and a video, but, you know, you'd have to put on a generator specially to do that. Um so we we didn't have much in the way of entertainment. So I did all of my best reading in her art. Yes. Um, I read some classics while I was there, but also cross stitch. Uh, you know, I would sit and cross stitch. Um, so yes, I did quite a bit of that while I was there. Well. Go, yeah, going to going to then to the market and stuff. What was that like? Were you in direct? I mean, I expect in work you had to um, directly co not confront, but work with the Taliban. What about on the mm. streets and stuff? Were you were you harassed at all? Was that something that was part of daily life? Um, it, it was to a certain extent, yes. Um, we would go to the market ourselves quite often or we might send uh, someone to go to the market for us. Um, you wouldn't find women in the market generally. They would either send a son or a husband to do that if they had a son and a husband to go. 
Um, if they didn't, they would go themselves and they would be harassed and we would be harassed. Um, now, the typical response was, you know, you might get touched um, on the bottom or something like that. Um, and the, the appropriate response to that was to turn around and whack them as hard as you could and to uh, shout at them, don't you have any shame? Um, that that was the response to do. So, and, um, you're not that tall, are you? You're, you're quite a you're quite petite. <laughs> We're talking about men with AK forty sevens. I mean, uh, um, well, these these might not always be the Taliban. Okay. They might just be just general men walking around. Yeah. You know, who saw a foreign woman and thought, well, yeah. let's give it a go, shall we? Yeah. Um, and so so that's what you would do. Um, I did. I have hit a, a, sh a soldier before now for um, touching me on the backside. Um, and he was then admonished by a little old lady walking the other way for his behaviour, wow. um, for what he did. Yeah. Um, and that's that's why you did it. You made a scene and you... It's about shame and honour. Um, and he was trying to take my honour and what I was doing was saying, that's mine, you can have the shame, I'm not having it. Wow. Um, and, and then they get admonished in in that way yeah. by passers-by who would see that what they've done is wrong yeah. uh, another thing that they might do is just stare you know just stand in your face and stare at you that would happen sometimes um or as you you walked around and i, I remember taking uh, this was in Kabul, but taking um some youngsters out for a meal in the youth club that i was running um for expat children and We'd, we'd stopped off to get some ice cream and these guys were just staring at, at them, at the girls, you know, the 13-year-old girls. They all had all the right gear on and everything. Um, and I might occasionally do this look at them, which was sort of, um, you know, what are you doing? What were your eyes looking at sort yeah. of thing as, as a way to admonish them for, for their behaviour. Goodness me. Um, so as the, all this is happening on, God's told you to go there. Did you ever question whether he sent you to the right place? No, no, I don't think I did. Um, sometimes I question whether he'd given me sufficient grace to stay. <laughs> um, and I think when I, I left after six years, um, and I think at that point, you know, the grace had left, as it were. Um, it, it was just too difficult at that point for me to continue. Actually, one of the things that I often did uh, was every day as I left the house, I might say, if I want to, I could get on the plane tomorrow and I could leave, mm -hmm. which is more than anyone else, you know, who I knew uh, a local could do. You know, I had a passport and if I wanted to tomorrow, I can go. And that, that actually helped yeah. in the, well, I do have that freedom. It's my choice that I'm staying and I'm, I'm choosing to stay. Yeah. So, Johnny, OK, so the story was, Sean's out there, I'm getting a better picture now of what I was letting myself in for yeah, if yeah. I had gone to Herat, particularly taking a guitar. I have no idea what on earth I was thinking about in the year 2000. But we were talking about it, Sean. We met up in uh, in Verdi's in, in Mumbles. You'd been, you were home on sort of furlough. And then uh, the 11th of September happened. I'm not sure where... Do you remember where you were, Johnny? When, when the, yes, when the I was coming back from the Goa and I'd been surfing, oh. and, I, and the radio was on in the car, and I think it was Steve Wright. He said, my God, he said, I don't know if this is a joke, but there's an airplane's gone into it. And then he said, oh, there's another one. And it was like yes. like listening to a film. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I was making a Quite record. Shocking. Yeah, I was making a record, and some people in the studio downstairs came up and said, you must come and look at the, these pictures. I was down in the mumbles. Yeah, yeah. Where were you, Sean? Do you remember when the news got to you in Herat? Oh, well, I wasn't in her art at the time. Oh. I was home on home leave. Right. Um, and um, I, I was with, well, I'd gone up to head office, as it were, um, uh, for a meeting. Um, we'd actually, uh, actually, at, not long before, all of our organisation had been kicked out of the country um, every, um, for various reasons. They, they, it would, all of the Christian groups had been kicked out. And so... Um, we were at that point thinking, oh, well, when do we get back? How? What are we going to do? And while we were there, the images of the, the jet, you know, the, the aeroplanes in the in the towers, was on the television screen. So, you know, we were, it, we hadn't a clue really at that point what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Obviously, Afghanistan became the target, didn't it? It became the target. All those forces went in. When did you go back? Was it, you know, was it a, a year, two years? What, what sort of gap oh, between it, the forces going in and you returning? They, I think the forces went in in October. Uh, I returned in February. Right. And what did you find when you got there? Was it a very different place? It was very different. And it was, it was actually... 
because I, I have very mixed feelings about the army and the armed defensive against it because obviously you know uh, i remember saying to someone you know they're dropping bombs on my friends right now it it, it, it was really difficult um but when we got back certainly uh, in Herat, the people were just so grateful and so glad that you know because the taliban were gone and they felt that they could start living again and so it was really d difficult sort of feeling a bit strange about the fact that this conflict had taken place and yet these people did literally feel liberated you know they 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 were sitting on top of the roofs of their buildings watching the rockets coming in because they were targeted rockets and and they felt safe mm -hmm. watching them mm -hmm. um so it was really strange but there was a it was a very different ebb. Many more humanitarian development organisations came in. Um, I think for the locals, some of that was mixed in that, that we still kept very conservative. We still dressed very conservatively. This was still, you know, a Muslim country and we still wanted to um, observe um, local decency, as it were. But certainly uh, other people coming in, we're dressed a little bit freely, and I think that that was a bit shocking for mm. some of the locals yeah. as well uh, to see that. But I think they felt, you know, schools were opening up, the hospitals had more provision, there was more different food in the shops, you know, that, it, uh, that there was more help coming through. And so um, for locals, it, it felt um, very freeing for them, and it was a different atmosphere um, for us on the street. You know, when you went back, and this, this feeling of liberation. But that sort of changed over the next couple of years, didn't it? it? Because if the Taliban weren't there, they weren't there to control things, and vacuums do create you know, problems. They do, and you're right, Mal, because security actually decreased. Uh, you know, perversely, under the Taliban, the security, road security, was, was reasonably safe um, because they had that really tight grip. Um, but when they left, um, you know, there were many more... Uh, robbers uh, um there, there were it was more dangerous to drive anywhere it was more dangerous to be on the streets in some ways you did have to be more careful one of the increasing threats was well firstly that you might get taliban sympathizers um attacking um expatriates and that did happen um and you may also uh, the the risk of kidnap was significantly increased for expatriates i think at one point there was something like $200,000 on the head of an expatriate, you know, while, while I was there. So um, that tension was there. And obviously you then also had ISAF, you know, so the UK, um, and the US, uh, Norwegian, you know, troops around on the streets um, very visibly. Um, I did feel really sorry for them, I have to say, it, because they couldn't relate to locals in the same way that, that we could. Um, but that you know that added an just a, a, an added air of or an air of anxiety. Um, you didn't quite know what was was going to happen. And I have to say, you know, going, you know, I found going down the market increasingly difficult, increasingly uh, annoying. Um, getting more harassment from the local men, not the Taliban, but just local men at that point who are perhaps getting access to the internet and things on the internet which weren't necessarily helpful in how they viewed expatriate women. Mm -hmm. Do you think they've changed their attitude slightly or are they going to be as radical as they were before? What do you think? Do you mean the Taliban? Yeah. Um, I think it really depends on how the international community relate to them, um, mm. Johnny, um, because, we, you know, at that point, we weren't having anything to do with them. And that, I think, partly allowed this this hole to emerge where, you know, Al-Qaeda uh, could come in and Osama bin Laden uh, could um, manipulate things behind the scenes. Um, whereas if, if we have relationships with them, whether it's direct or indirect, then we can put more pressure on their behaviour. They yeah. also want to be seen as players on the international scene. And so they do, in some ways, want to be doing the right things. Mm. Um, whether they do or not, you know, is, is another matter. And, you know, we need to keep an eye on that. Um, at the moment, the women are being asked to stay at home and not go into work. At the moment, the girls are not going to school. 
So, it, um, but I know that they, I understand that they have been targeting people, they have been arresting people, have been arresting activists. So it's, 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 it's a case of let's watch and see, shall we? Let's yeah, see yeah, what happens. Yeah. Um, we've nearly run out of time. Um, you, you say maybe you'd run out of grace. So you came, you came home. What about your contacts with, with your, your friends? Are you able to keep in contact with any of the people that you, you, you know, had relationships with? And, and what's the feeling on the ground back home? Yes, yeah. I mean, through social media, I've still got links out there. Um, they feel pretty desperate now. Um, they feel abandoned and betrayed, really. Um, and they're, they're really afraid. Mm. Afraid for themselves, afraid for their families, afraid for their country. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's quite, quite difficult. Yeah. I'm told they're lovely people, friendly people, you know, welcoming people normally without all the pressures put upon them. Is that is that your memory of Afghanistan? Absolutely. Uh, welcoming, hospitable, kind. Um, I, you know, the men that I worked with were like my uncles and my brothers to me. And I knew that if ever I was in trouble, they would help me and they would protect me. Um, that that was how much I trusted them. Mm. Uh, what does the future hold for you now, then, Sean? What are you working on? Oh, I'm doing all sorts of things. Um, I'm um, a hospital chaplain. Right. Uh, at the moment. Um, I'm learning I to speak Welsh. A... You're learning to speak Welsh. Now, Johnny can help you. Why are you learning to speak Welsh? Because yeah, lo- that's a lovely story as well. Um, well, I'm learning. My, my, my mother's, I said my mother's Welsh. She has now moved into a residential home near me, um, but she has dementia. And so she quite often mistakes me for her sister. And so she talks to me in Welsh when she does that. Now, I, I was brought up in Sussex um, and I, I didn't learn Welsh. So I'm now learning Welsh so that, uh, you know, when, when that happens, I can, even if I'm not very good at responding or forming sentences, I may have a better chance of understanding what she's saying and at least answering her correctly in English, yeah. even if I can't answer her properly in Welsh. You learned Welsh, hey. didn't you? At, 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 I, at I learned Welsh age? when I was 33. I went and did the, the old pan course, which is, a, um, I used to go three hours every day. For three, for three months and then then I had a good working knowledge and after that I did course my strolly which is to make it better and from there on I'm completely fluent yeah. but I mean uh, I, I've got a Welsh wife which helps yeah. well, you've, got, you've got a Welsh yeah you've got a Welsh man Sean so that that'll help as well I'm, I'm sure well look yeah. it's been lovely it's been a very different man and Johnny show uh, you've really enlightened us and I think inspired, yeah, very inspired us uh, as well and um, we wish you all the best and if you are you know our, our thoughts and our prayers go to your your friends and family out there in, in Herat as well and um, maybe one day we'll both get there again Sean maybe one day indeed indeed we, we wait and see but thank you very much alright God bless you bye bye Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.